Hi everybody, my name is Oli. I'm a foundation year two junior doctor living and working in the northeast of England. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now the grades of doctors are confusing at the very best of times, both to the colleagues that we work with and to NHS patients. For example, you were a patient on an NHS ward and I appeared on the ward round and said, good morning, I'm Dr. Burton, I'm one of the FY2 doctors, or I'm one of the house officers, or I'm one of the registrars. Would you know what that meant? So in this video, I'm going to try and tidy things up a little bit and go through some of the most common grades of doctor that you're likely to encounter day to day within the NHS. But before we jump into that, we need to very quickly understand that things have been made much more confusing by two big overhauls that have happened in medical training. The first of which was modernizing medical careers in 2005 and then more recently a big review called Shape of Training. The point of MMC was to streamline medical training in order to generate consultants more quickly in a more efficient way. And the more recent Shape of Training places an emphasis on general medicine. Instead of producing hyper subspecialists, we are instead producing medical consultants who receive training in general medicine all the way through their careers, making them more able to handle a range of problems on the ward. And the wrinkles of these changes aren't important for the purposes of this video, but we just need to understand that it's these two things that have led to some of the confusion in doctors' titles. And it's absolutely no surprise that even our own colleagues have become very lost with what exactly our grades and titles mean. So let's jump into the video. Anyway, let's get started with the most junior grades, what everyone thinks of for the most part as a junior doctor. Foundation year one and foundation year two are your first two years practicing as a doctor after you qualify. The foundation on which the rest of your training is built, not forgetting that people have already spent four, five, six years at medical school just to get to this point. These are qualified, highly trained professionals who even at this level run most of the day-to-day -day management on the wards, making sure that patients actually receive the care plans that have been put in place for them. And day to day on a ward, it is these foundation doctors that you'll mostly see working alongside nurses, healthcare assistants, physiotherapists, dieticians, pharmacists, any of the other allied health professions that you would also see on a typical ward. The only real distinction between them is that an FY1, a foundation year one doctor, is essentially an extension of their supervising consultant. They are not an independent practitioner, whereas that foundation year two doctor, someone of my grade, by that point has their full medical license and is an independent practitioner much more responsible for their own actions. Now here's the first point of confusion. Before the introduction of the foundation program as part of modernizing medical careers, these doctors were usually known as house officers. The FY1 or the first year doctor was known as a pre-reg or a pre-registration house officer, just as we see in other disciplines like pharmacy and then they would move up in their second year to a senior house officer or an SHO. And they were called house officers or housemen because they essentially lived at the hospital in hospital accommodation and were always therefore on site. Now in today's world, after the introduction of the foundation program, FY2, foundation year two, second year of practice and SHO, are often used synonymously. It's essentially trying to capture the position of someone who is still relatively junior compared to lots of other doctors, but is also not brand new to the NHS, is capable of getting on with things independently, and thus can be afforded a bit more independence and work in more complex environments. But because someone at this level is independently licensed, as we've said after FY1, there is the distinct possibility that someone may wish to remain at this level for the rest of their lives or certainly a significant amount of time. Let's say, for example, that you've done your F1 and F2, your first two years of practice. By the time you get to F2, you are an SHO. You might decide following this to spend another year working in a department at this level. You would be known as a trust grade SHO, someone who has taken on a separate contract for a year working at this same SHO level. You might then decide to do the same thing again, but instead this time you're gonna go and work as a locum doctor in A&E for another year again at the SHO level. So by this point, this person now has four years of postgraduate experience, but because they haven't progressed in a training program, they are still working at the SHO level. There is obviously a big difference between this doctor 
and an FY2, someone like me who has only got a year of experience under their belt and has started their second year. So the term SHO is quite broad ranging and this is one of the reasons why it's fallen out of favour a little bit. So now let's move towards specialty training. You've done your foundation year one, your foundation year two and potentially some number of SHO years practicing at this same grade, you've decided that you now want to apply for specialty training. Now you need to decide whether or not, broadly speaking, you are going to train as a medic, that is someone working in the physician specialties, things like cardiology, or respiratory medicine, or you're going to become a surgeon. There are obviously more things you can do, but let's keep it simple for now. For the next two years at this point, you will be called either a core trainee, a core surgical trainee, if you go down the surgical route, or an IMT, internal medicine trainee. So for the next two years, you would either be a CT1 or a CT2, core trainee, one and two for surgery, or an IMT1, IMT2 for medical specialties. Just to recap, because this is all very complicated, you finish medical school, you've done foundation year one, foundation year two, you decide you want to go into specialty training as a surgeon, so you would then do core training one, core training two for a total of four postgraduate years for this hypothetical doctor. Medical trainees at this point may need to do an additional year at this grade known as IMT3. This depends very much on the particular specialty in medicine that you wish to do. And the point of this third year is to prepare people for the next grade on the list which is the registrar. A registrar is an experienced doctor. Remember that we are now at least five years postgraduate at the very minimum, that has dedicated themselves to one particular specialty. So this is the earliest point at which a doctor can dedicate themselves only to one single specialty within medicine. So for example, you could be a registrar in psychiatry, in cardiology, in general surgery. All specialties will have registrars because this is the main training grade within that specialty. It is very competitive to become a registrar, increasingly so for all specialties in medicine now because there is a big shortage of training posts. And not only will these doctors be very good to get to this level, and they will have sat a prerequisite set of exams and joined the relevant Royal College, but increasingly they will also have very good CVs, including teaching experience, leadership qualifications, published academic papers, additional degrees, and more on top of that. It's becoming harder and harder to get these posts, and as such, the people are becoming more and more and more qualified. And a doctor will spend several years at this registrar grade before progressing again, and the amount of time spent at this grade will depend on the particular specialty. And then finally, they will reach what's called the consultant grade, sometimes known as an attending physician or surgeon in other healthcare systems. This is a doctor who has fully completed their specialty training and has received what's called their CCT, or their Certificate of Completion of Training. This is the culmination of all of those years of training, passing a high stake set of exams, becoming a fellow of the relevant Royal College for many specialties. And all of that is necessary because these are the bosses, the most experienced doctors we have that are ultimately responsible for leading and driving patient care in the NHS. If you're a patient in the NHS, you will have a named consultant who is responsible for your care while you're an inpatient. And the reason this is so important is there is no other professional within the NHS that has the same degree of training and responsibility that a consultant does. Many consultants will have developed a subspecialty interest as part of their training. Usually this takes the form of an additional year of training and will often lead services of that type within their hospital or their setting. For example, if you are a cardiology consultant, consultant, you may have developed a specialty interest in heart failure, in electronic implantable devices such as pacemakers and defibrillators, or indeed maybe in interventional cardiology, the doctors who go in and remove clots from the coronary arteries when people have heart attacks. So that's the bulk of the main grades out the way. I'm just going to run through really quickly five remaining job titles that you may hear about if you're working with doctors in the NHS. The first is Junior Clinical Fellows and Teaching Fellows. These are temporary, usually year-long contracts that people take up after their foundation training but before specialty training, usually with some attached purpose to them. Junior Clinical Fellows will typically be getting more experience 
in a particular specialty, or teaching fellows, as the name suggests, might be developing experience in teaching medical students and working on a qualification in teaching alongside their clinical responsibilities. Academic clinical fellows are a little bit further on in their training. They are usually in the very early years of their specialty training, and these are doctors who have embarked on the academic clinical pathway. So these are doctors that are combining research in medicine with their specialty interests and it's very common for these doctors to go on and do PhDs in their specialty area while they are working towards becoming a consultant. A professor is then the summit of this academic medicine pathway and they are not only consultants in their own specialty, so experts in the medical delivery side of things, they are also academic experts in the evidence body that underpins the medicine that is done in the field. A professor is essentially a world level expert in that area of medicine and is expected to drive new knowledge in that field so that we can look after patients. If you have a professor in charge of your care while you're an NHS patient, be rest assured that you've got one of the most knowledgeable people in the country, potentially even in the world, looking after you. The fourth term is specialty and associate specialist doctors, sometimes known as SAS doctors. And these are doctors that have achieved a significant number of years of experience in a particular specialty, but are not currently enrolled in a training program and are not actively working towards becoming a consultant. The pathway to becoming a consultant is not the right fit for everyone, and it's very possible for these doctors to become very, very experienced in the field in which they work. And lots of work needs to be done to bring these doctors parity with consultants to make sure that patients are receiving the best standard of care possible. And then the last term is locum doctors. I've mentioned it before in this video, but a locum doctor is someone filling in locum tenens, occupying the place of another doctor at any of the grades that we've discussed thus far in this video. The rates for locum doctors usually pay two to three times the salary for the equivalent NHS doctor because these posts are usually only short-term contracts, they can literally only be a day or two of work and usually they're required on short notice. But they're a good opportunity for doctors to earn more money if they need it and earn a better salary that full-time work in the NHS would give them. So thank you very much for watching guys, I hope that's cleared things up. If you've got any questions about any of the grades I've discussed in this video or a grade that I haven't covered because there are very many within the medical sphere, let me know and I'll help you out in the comments below. Take care and I'll see you next time.